Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the last um, panel of the day, um, our last bit of business before our keynote. Um, I, my name is Goli Yamini. I am a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Science Foundation and uh, at the Division of Information and Intelligence Systems, and I'm thrilled to co-chair the session uh, with my colleague, Dr. Shadi Mamagani, who is also a AAAS Fellow at the NSF. Um, it's been an amazing day, so thank you to all the panelists and uh, the audience for the great questions. Um, again, as a reminder, we have our keynote uh, followed uh, right after this panel. Um, we are very, very excited <laughs> and grateful uh, to our three fabulous panelists who are joining us today, Dr. Tarasi, Wachter, and Najib. And as a reminder, uh, please send your questions to AI Symposium Questions at Gmail. Uh, to be answered by our panels right after the talks. Uh, now I'm delighted to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Georgia Tarasi. Uh, Dr. Tarasi is the director of the National Center for Computational Sciences at the Oak Ridge National Lab and an adjunct professor at Duke University and University of Tennessee. She is a celebrated scientist with more than 250 publications and patents and notable no, uh, number of notable awards and honors. Um, her research interests are in artificial intelligence and biomedicine, bioinformatics and more. And today she will be sharing a scientist perspective of the social and ethical implications of AI. Uh, my colleague Shadi is going to introduce our other two wonderful panelists. Shadi, the virtual panel, the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Koli. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As my colleague introduced me, my name is Shadi Mamagani. I'm a AAAS uh, Science and Technology Policy Fellow at National Science Foundation. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Sandra Wachter. Uh, Dr. Wachter is an Associate Professor and Senior Research Fellow in Law and Ethics of AI, Big Data and Robotics, as well as Internet Regulation at the Oxford Inter Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. Professor Wachter is also a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. Honored to have you here with us all the way from UK, Dr. Wachter. I would also like to proudly introduce Dr. Dalal Najib, the Director of the Science and Engineering Capacity Development at the National Academy of Sciences. In this role, Dr. Najib leads science and engineering capacity development activities at the Policy and Global Affairs Division of the US National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. She's also the program director for the Arab American Frontiers Program of Science, Engineering, and Medicine at NASA. Glad to have you here with us, Dr. Najib. And with that, I would like to request Peggy to start the presentations. And we will have a live Q&A right after the presentations. Thank you so much. As a formerly trained physicist and engineer with decades of applied AI experience, I have observed the growth, subsequent stagnation, and latest renaissance of AI. In the context of this panel, I would like to give the scientists' perspective, trying to manage the societal and ethical implications of artificial intelligence. AI is pervasive, impacting all aspects of our daily life. As artificial intelligence systems are moving from being perceived as a tool to being perceived as autonomous agents and teammates, an important focus of research and development is understanding the ethical impact of these systems. The explosive growth of AI is driven by the convergence of big data, massive computational power, and novel algorithms. Together, these are the three pillars that enable AI to accumulate, analyze, and automate the delivery of functional knowledge in many application domains. There are many examples demonstrating the potential of AI. For example, in health, this is an area where I draw my research experience. There are several, several successful systems with respect to uh, artificial intelligence for computer-aided diagnosis, AI systems to optimize clinical workflows, as well as systems to support scientific discovery by enabling holistic analysis of multimodality biomedical data. Recently, we have also seen AI being deployed in the war against the novel coronavirus, with applications ranging from bioinformatics and drug discovery to understanding the spread of the virus as the conditions on the ground change. 
while machines will not replace physicians and nurses anytime remotely soon, they do have enormous potential to assist health professionals and other decision makers with time critical decisions. And while health is only one facet of life, using artificial intelligence to augment and improve human performance remains the main driver. Still though, the hope of AI must be tempered. Artificial intelligence is often exaggerated with hype and unrealistic expectations of universal benefits. This perception can lead those outside the AI research community to believe that AI is the silver bullet. Artificial intelligence faces the necessary reality check that it has limitations and there are social implications by not transparently addressing these limitations. With AI's great promise comes an even greater responsibility. I will briefly discuss separately the ethical and societal implications related first to sensitive data management and use, and second to AI algorithmic development and practice in the real world, uh, often using healthcare as an example. First of all, access to large amounts of data is fundamental to AI. That's why data is considered the currency of the 21st century. Often access to data is more of a policy uh, challenge rather, rather than a technical challenge. For example, access to sensitive patient data is necessary to drive deeper understanding of human health and disease. How to preserve privacy while computing with patient data is an outstanding issue for domains such as health and medicine. Removing personal identifiers and confidential details is often insufficient as a highly skilled individual can still make inferences to recover aspects of the data. There can be intentional attacks, not only to the data itself, but the AI model. When aggregating data from different sources, the most vulnerable source establishes the overall security level. And for that reason, privacy preserving AI is a hot topic attracting a lot of attention from the scientific community. We also need to address sensitive questions about data ownership and use, as the line between research use and commercial use of personal data is blurring. To maintain a strong ethical framework for AI, we need to answer this fundamental question. Who owns the intellectual property of AI technology? The individual who contributed the data, for example, the patient herself. The entity collecting the data by providing a service, for example, the hospital or the healthcare delivery expert. Or the AI developer who develops algorithm and code. Clearly, no single entity alone could deliver the breakthrough technology. With respect to the ethics of AI, there are two aspects development and deployment. For development, we know that AI algorithms are not immune to low quality or biased data. And on the deployment front, there are pressing questions on AI interpretability, AI vulnerability to adversarial use, and human AI integration to augment and not inadvertently handicap the, the human. These topics should be driving our research priorities and investments. Therefore, I advocate a multi-pronged approach throughout the AI life cycle. During the development phase, scientists should promote a rigorous statistical framework to monitor for potential biases in the collected data. During the deployment phase, AI developers and regulatory bodies should implement rigorous quality control monitoring AI performance across subgroups to confirm robust behavior or identify performance gaps. We should also work to communicate to AI users openly and clearly so that they are informed consumers of the technology. Responsible use of AI technology should become part of our mainstream digital education. To conclude, Artificial intelligence is expected to offer solutions to many uh, challenging problems. 
but the implications of this disruptive change cannot be underestimated. Scientists will continue to produce code faster than we can deliver policies. Close attention to the ethical, legal, and societal implications of AI will be required to ensure that its benefits are shared and its risks are managed and minimized. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Dr. Wachter. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra Wachter. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Oxford, and I'm also a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. So let's just start with fairness in AI. I think most of you will be aware that whenever you talk about algorithms, you also always have to talk about fairness and bias. Um, the reason is that algorithms learn from historical data. Historical data is biased. The algorithm picks up those biases and is replicating them into the future. A uh, very um, standard example is, for example, when we make hiring decisions. Um, what an algorithm will do is it will look at past records of successful candidates in the past, learn the patterns of those successful candidates, and will then make similar decisions in the future. And if you just look back who has been promoted, who has been fired, um, who has been hired in the past, you will see that this will replicate certain inequalities. So for example, women are going to be less likely to uh, be hired than men because that's just usually the pattern that happened in the past. So we all know that. Um, uh, that those biases can be replicated into the future. And many people will say, well, the law actually already has answers to that problem um, because we have laws like non-discrimination law that have, that, that the purpose is that they deal with those inequalities. And that is one of my research areas. Um, but I do have my doubts on whether or not those laws are actually still good and fit for purpose in a society where algorithm making very important decisions about us. So one of my, um, uh, papers is called Why Fairness Cannot Be Automated, um, Bridging the Gap Between Non-Discrimination Law and AI. The, pub the paper is publicly available on SSRN if anybody wants to have a look at it. Um, similar paper here that I wrote that is called Affinity Profiling and Discrimination by Association in Online Behavioral Advertisement is also publicly available if you want to have a look. Um, basically, what those papers were trying to do is look at the current legal standards that we have and assess if they're still good enough. And the problem is, I don't believe it. And I don't believe it because the laws were designed to govern the behavior of humans. Non-discrimination law was designed to keep um, discriminatory humans in check. And all the tools that we have to develop um, to investigate, prevent, and punish discriminatory behavior just does not easily translate onto algorithms. Algorithms are more abstract and unintuitive in their acting. They're more subtle and intangible. And it's more difficult to detect discriminatory algorithmic behavior than human behavior. To give you two examples that show that quite greatly is what could be a, a hindrance is that claimants might not actually feel that they're discriminated against. And the second thing is that they might not have access to evidence to bring a claim. So start with the feeling of being discriminated, right? So for example, um, somebody might tell you to your face, I'm not going to hire you because you're a woman, or I'm in creating a, such a toxic environment where women cannot succeed. Point being is that you will actually feel that something's off, something is treating you unfairly. You see other people getting promoted over your head, for example, and you use that to bring a claim. The problem is that now we do actually have algorithms to do that dirty work for you. So think of a job um, environment again. Algorithms are able to infer whether you're a woman or not before you actually see a job advertisement. So when you're searching the web and you want to find a job, an algorithm might detect that you're a woman. And the problem is that's your result. You just don't see the advertisement anymore because you have been filtered out from the get go. So you don't even know that you don't see the full truth. You only see the part of the truth, but not the whole picture. So you will never know that you're being treated unfairly and you will never bring a claim. And this is just one example um, with job advertisements, but we can see there's a range of different applications as well, right? When you're searching the web, um, the results are being tailored to you. Whatever you tweet and what you see on Twitter is being tailored to you. The posts on Facebook are being tailored to you. The prices that you see on Amazon, all of those are being tailored to you. There is no objective truth. You only see part of the truth. And this is especially troubling, for example, with prices. Um, look at it from... Um, the analog world, you are going to a supermarket and if you're lucky enough and they still have toilet paper, you can go back and forth and choose the product that has the best price for value. 
that comparative element is increasingly eroded in a world of algorithms because you only get to see one price and you don't know if you get a better price or worse price than somebody else. You don't know that you might be disadvantaged. And the truth is that this is your reality. You're walking around with blinders that prevent you from seeing that you are being treated unfairly and therefore you're not going to use the legal tools that you have to fight um, on discrimination. The second point has to do that you have to bring evidence when you're in court and show that you're being treated unfairly. It has always been the case, but it's getting increasingly more difficult. And the problem is, again, um, because algorithms are different than humans in the way that they make um, decisions and in the way that they discriminate against people. So judges usually would use intuition to decide cases. They would rely on common knowledge and obvious facts and convictions, which is fine because they had to deal with real life cases, people being discriminatory towards people. The methods that those humans were using were immediately, um, the inequality was immediately apparent. To give you a couple of examples, if I told you an employer is banning headscarves um, from the workplace, you will immediately know that this could have a discriminatory impact on freedom of religion. If I told you that an employer is only granting social benefits to married couples, you will know that this will have an impact um, on, uh, could be discriminatory um, based on sexual orientation. If I told you that I'm only hiring people with short hair, you will immediately know that this could have a negative impact on women. Those, if this is your social guts, basically. Those make it very clear how certain groups can be discriminated against. With algorithms, they are using very untraditional data sources and different methods and different data and different criteria to discriminate against people. So they use your shopping behavior. What does your food say about you? What does the food that you enjoy say about you? How does it relate to sexual orientation, to gender, to ethnicity, to religion? Similarly here, um, the movies that you watch or the films that you enjoy is being collected and is being used to assess you. How does that relate to uh, inequality? Um, sexual orientation, gender. You don't know what does it say about you. And lastly, your reading behavior, the newspapers that you enjoy. What do they say about you? And how does it relate to protected attributes? It's not really clear, but you need to show that there is a connection between your protected attribute, the data that is being used. And if there is no clear apparent link anymore, this would be very hard. And it links me to the second point of my presentation, which has to do with privacy. Again, with the examples that I showed you, it's very clear that you not it's not really clear what your data actually says about you. So, for example, what does your browsing behavior say about you? We know now that what you search on, on the Internet can be used to infer your health status, for example, if it has Alzheimer's disease or not. That is something that people might not be aware of. Whatever you tweet on Twitter can reveal your gender and your ethnicity, and that's maybe something that is not something that is immediately in your head. And lastly, your friends on Facebook are a good enough indication of your sexual orientation. Again, data that you're volunteering that reveals very intimate details about you um, that you might not anticipate. And I wrote a paper on, on, on that topic, which is called A Right to Reasonable Inferences, Rethinking Data Protection in the Age of Big Data and AI, which is asking the question, do we have a right to be reasonably assessed? Is data protection law actually good enough to help us prevent those very privacy invasive uh, inferences from happening? And the truth is that I don't think that we do, unfortunately. Again, you can read that paper, it's publicly available. Um, one of the reasons is that those inferences, those assumptions, those opinions that algorithms make about us are often considered a trade secret. It is something that companies create and that you very, uh, very, there's very little right of access, so that a lot of times you will even, you won't even know what uh, companies are inferring about you, and there's almost no no way to uh, have any kind of recourse or rectify the data. So to close with a couple of solutions there, um, as I said, I think um, that um, AI has a lot of very good potential and we should definitely use it, but we have to safeguard it in a responsible manner. We have to make sure that we have an appropriate holistic approach, a good mixture between privacy protection and non-discrimination. I'm advocating for a right to reasonable inferences, that we develop standards that justify that certain inferences are being drawn about you and that you have the ability to know about them and potentially rectify them. And we need to make sure that um, the public sector and, the com uh, and, and companies are having post and 
ex ante and expose bias audits built into them because it's going to be so hard to detect bias on your own because you won't have access to that. If we do that, I believe that we can use AI for the good, have um, social and economic growth, and at the same time protect fundamental rights in our society. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much for, for having me. And I'm looking forward to um, the discussion and to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Dr. Najib. Today, I will talk to you about the implications of artificial intelligence on international development. My work mainly revolves around how science and technology innovation can be a driver of international development and what are the implications for policymaking. I've worked in different geographic regions, namely in the Middle East, North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and I've noticed that artificial intelligence is becoming an important topic that not only informs new research directions in these regions, but also gets the attention of local governments and policymakers. When we think AI, many of us imagine applications in futuristic settings in advanced countries. There is a reason for that. Advanced countries such as the United States, European Union, China, have been heavily investing in AI over the past few years. This map shows the government's AI readiness index across the world. This index was developed by a company called Oxford Insight to show how well placed our national governments to take advantage of the benefits of artificial intelligence in their operations and delivery of public services. The results sought to capture the current capacity of governments to exploit the innovative potential of AI. As you can see in this figure, there is a clear north-south divide. Yet, even if governments in low- and middle-income countries may not necessarily be fully ready, AI applications are currently being implemented in many countries of the global south. But let's ask ourselves, why artificial intelligence matters for these countries? I like this picture, and not just because I took it. It shows a woman from a Maasai village in Arusha in northern Tanzania. This was from a USAID-funded peer project to bring electricity to the village. As you can see, it was successful. But while the woman is holding a light bulb, she's also, she's also having a smartphone around her neck, which is a very useful device and can help collect data on cattle, crops, and health, her own health, her children's health. AI, just like electricity or IT, is a general purpose technology, also called GPT, that can be applied across numerous areas and is moving very rapidly. GPTs are technologies with pervasive use and application in a wide range of sectors that reshape the economy. So when we talk about accelerating development, eradicating poverty and promoting prosperity, the role of leapfrog technologies is crucial. Leapfrog technologies are disruptive and they are key for low to middle income countries to be able to catch up with more advanced nations. Artificial intelligence is a highly disruptive technology because it can result in a steep change in the cost, can dramatically change how we gather data, make products, interact. By not adapting AI, there is also a risk of a widening gap between the rich and the poor. Failing to take advantage of AI and all the opportunities it offers can be costly. If countries from the global south fail to harness the economic and societal benefits of AI and are unable to compete in the future global economy, they will be left behind. Let's briefly discuss potential applications of AI in international development. One of the most obvious examples in the health sector. You may have heard that a number of automated services monitoring social media and news outlets were the first to sound the international alarm about the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, imagine how this could apply to Ebola in West Africa when combined with environmental and wildlife data on bats or to cholera outbreaks combined with water quality data, or disease diagnosis where machine learning models um, for examining medical images can catch early signs of disease that human doctors might miss. Another example is agriculture. In Africa, about 70% of the population depends on agriculture for their livelihoods, and smallholder farmers account for 90% of food production. Artificial intelligence and satellite imagery can help measure and predict crop yield, thus increasing the resilience of smallholder farmers and inform government decision making. For example, in Tanzania, some farmers are utilizing the services of a simple AI assistant by waving a phone over a plant leaf, and then they receive a software diagnosis of the disease or pest affecting that plant and suggestions on how to treat it, 
Once downloaded, this app no longer requires wireless access to cellular data. This is a huge advantage. And water scarcity is also a pressing issue globally and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. IBM, which has offices in Kenya and South Africa, has developed a new solution using big data and Internet of Things technology to help small-scale farmers better manage the water resources needed to irrigate and grow their crops. Education is already changing due to AI. Students are no longer utilizing libraries to find information when they can just Google it. AI also enables personalized learning and can complement the teacher's role. This is important in countries and regions where illiteracy and dropout rates are still high. Health, agriculture, education are only examples of a wide range of applications of artificial intelligence. There is also humanitarian assistance, making financial services more inclusive, or streamlining government operations. In summary, AI applications are numerous in low- and middle-income countries, and we have several examples of ongoing projects in the Global South. Companies are taking notes. Google AI opened an office in Accra, Ghana, while IBM has two offices in Nairobi and South Africa. And uh, in Morocco and Tunisia, we're seeing an increasing investment by governments in artificial intelligence. Tunisia has started developing a national strategy in artificial intelligence and has organized several workshops for policymakers and stakeholders. In Morocco, a school dedicated to AI has recently opened in FES. So we can see that artificial intelligence has a huge potential in international development. But there are also pitfalls and ethical considerations. First, fairness. Well, the benefits of AI are not always evenly distributed. With increased automations of jobs, real wages will fall, leading to increased inequality. When talking about AI and machine learning, there is also an assumption of abundant data. However, this is not the case in many low-income countries where data is scarce. Inequal access to data will result in countries with larger data sets having a clear advantage. Bias and discrimination are also a concern. Biased data lead to biased outputs, meaning incorrect and unfair results. An AI system can produce biased results. Privacy issues include invasion of privacy, challenges to informed consent, personal profiling. And there is also intellectual property. Only human-created IP is subject to IP protection. How would the World Intellectual Property Organization handle AI-created IP? When it comes to governance, let's keep in mind that AI technology is evolving rapidly and exponentially rather than in a linear pace. While regulatory bodies at the national and international levels move at a much slower pace than the technology. This makes regulation difficult. Many automated decision systems operate as black boxes. They lack transparency, transparency, which makes accountability difficult. How can informed policy decisions be made without fully understanding these systems? Policymakers are taking steps to mitigate these risks. With member states of the OECD and some emerging countries have recently endorsed a set of principles to promote responsible stewardship of AI. Also, the role of corporations and the private sector should not be overlooked because they are the major drivers of uh, R&D and AI. Experts have called for the introduction of an AI code of ethics requiring AI audits and providing means of remediation for AI damages. Ultimately, regulation of AI is tricky, so rather than focusing on regulation of AI itself, we should focus on regulations of, of specific applications of AI. In summary, artificial intelligence can be a game changer for low to middle income countries. It is a leapfrog technology that is disruptive and if used appropriately can lead to economic growth. The applications are wide from agriculture, health, education, humanitarian assistance, etc. In fact, many AI centers have already been established in the global south and are up and running. However, in the absence of proper regulation and policies in place, AI can be a double-edged sword due to many legitimate ethical concerns. Finally, international cooperation on AI will continue to be important, especially for countries that still lack the know-how and infrastructure. Developing country researchers can benefit from the knowledge transfer from their US or European counterparts. At the same time, researchers from advanced countries like the US We'll explore new applications of artificial intelligence and address new research questions in a developing country context. 
However, it would be best to start engaging in areas that maximize public benefits, such as health and education, for example. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to our panelists for those, uh, for the wonderful presentations. Um, I have like all the ideas bouncing around in my head and we've been getting a lot of great questions. Um, so I want to get to our audience questions. Uh, start from that. If I just wanted to ask uh, our panelists if they could uh, turn on their videos and audios. And uh, the questions that we'll be addressing um, mostly will be to the whole panel, but it, sometimes it'll be to a certain panelist. But you please feel free to jump in and let's have a great discussion. Um, so the first question that actually has been coming up a couple of times throughout the day is about um, current policy standards on how AI algorithms are trained, what the scope quality, um, quantity and quality of data is used. And um, the, attend the audience actually basically wants to know what your uh, suggestions and recommendations are for such policies, especially regarding transparency requirements for AI algorithms and training protocols. Sorry, it's a uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, you're good. Yes, okay, great. Um, yes, thank you for that great question. It is definitely a question that keeps me up at night as well. Um, yeah, the, the, the main problem is that we don't really have um, good frameworks in, in, in place yet. Um, it's a uh, technology, it's always the catch up game. Obviously, you have technology that is developing very, very fast and law, and law is catching up in a slow way and a democratic process takes some time. So that is definitely um, something that is a hindrance at the moment. I think though the more important question is that we really haven't thought about um, what a society should look like um, in terms of uh, how we wanna shape it. So we have a lot of ideas around procedural rights in the sense that, yeah, you have transparency and you have consent and you have to be like open about what you do and there are certain things you can do cannot do you're not allowed to do like non-discrimination law but nobody actually tells you what you should be doing what is actual ethical behavior what are the benefits that we can reap from that what are the trade-offs that we're facing how can we deploy this in a way that it actually benefits the most what is an ethical computer scientist look like what's an ethical engineer we have never really asked those questions yet um and that that is definitely one of the problems that we that we're dealing with right now that we are more thinking about you cannot do this rather than think about you should be doing this i would also like to add a few comments um not so much from the policy perspective. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Not so much from the policy perspective, but from the regulatory side of things. Um, again, using healthcare as an example, because in the biomedical space, there have been computer-aided diagnostic systems regulated since the late 90s. So we, we uh, learned a lot of hard lessons through that process. And I would say from uh, the Food and Drug Administration perspective, there are already um, well-developed, um, fairly well-developed guidelines that have been updated throughout the years in terms of how we properly train these systems, how we optimize them, how we test them, and how we deploy them in the world and evaluate the technology by itself, as we call it a standalone uh, technology, but also evaluate uh, the technology in the hand of the users if the technology is intended to augment the human. And that's actually an area where we made some, uh, as a scientific community, uh, we made some uh, assumptions that were proven to be wrong that a technology that is developed and intended to be used in a certain way, it will be used uniformly that way. And we learned that, that that is not the case. So certainly from the biomedical space and the, from the Food and Drug Administration perspective, there are lots of important lessons that have been documented. And we have seen how the guidelines have evolved throughout the years. And certainly with the recent uh, movement of deep learning to uh, reflect 
the latest technological developments. But certainly it's a work in progress. Thank you for that. Um, Shadi, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah, sure. So this, is, this question is uh, from Stephen Reed to everyone. Better policies and regulations are all well and good, but how can they be effectively enforced? For example, what would be a realistic incentive to get companies to act ethically and in the interest of justice? Should there be more regulatory focus on algorithmic procurement and development? Yeah, um, I think that's an excellent, an excellent question. Um, and I think it, the, the question puts the finger on, on exactly the right topic, which is that at the moment there's a lot of talking about AI principles um, and they're very vague. Um, there are things like you should be fair and you should be transparent and you should be just and you should be accountable, but nobody will disagree with that. Like nobody will say, oh, we want unfair and privacy invasive um, algorithms and we want people that are not accountable. Like nobody will openly um, say that that's the type of technology that we really want. However, there is not enough work being done to think about how we can translate that into practice. It's not going to be very helpful for an engineer to say, be a fair and transparent person. You actually need to give some you know, um, guidance on how and in what ways they should change their behavior. And this is where the interesting work actually starts. And this will also show how much disagreement actually is between people about what they consider fair or private. So that's a lot of work that, that needs to be done and that isn't being done. In terms of what you can use, I think in some instances, hard laws that are enforceable are the right way to go. I think in other instances, um, soft touch regulations or guidance um, or the yeah, codes of ethics m might be fine. It really depends on what the sector is, what the risk model is. And I think that leads me to the, the final thing that I don't think it's a necessary good idea to say, let's have a couple of principles to guide AI policy, really looking at the application, where it's being deployed, who is using it, for what purpose, what are the benefits and the risks that come, you f can come from that, and then think about how ethical behavior actually looks on the ground because the risks and the benefits are very different. Um, health has very different benefits and trade-offs as opposed to criminal justice and very, again, very different than education or loan applications or whatever that might be. So the benefits and the trade-offs and the risks are different and therefore um, deserve detailed and agile attention. Um, I would like to comment on that too. I would say that right now as a society, we are approaching the problem in a very reactive way. We develop the technology and we try to think of policies, regulations, frameworks in place to continuously um, monitor the performance, audit the products, which I absolutely agree that we need to stay vigilant in terms of um, monitoring the technology on a continuous basis. As a scientist myself, though, I do believe that we need to uh, be more proactive. Right now, the implications of AI and the regulation of AI seems to be an afterthought. We develop the product, we deploy it, and then we start looking at the long-term implications. Where in reality, when, we, when scientists need to be sitting at the table with the diverse community um, with all the stakeholders, the legal side, the policy side, and the ethics side from the beginning, from the moment we start thinking about the development of the technology. If we sit at the table early on and all of these entities are engaged uh, from the beginning, that proactive approach will help um, later on uh, discoveries, the oops kind of moment I should have designed the experiment better. I should have collected data differently. I should have developed a statistical framework um, that addresses these issues. And all these, sometimes as scientists, we don't ask these questions. We have a big pot of data. We have a lot of compute and we go after it. And we need that reality check that will come from the ethics, uh, from the ethicist, from the policy maker, from the legal side to um, keep us, uh, aware, alert, <laughs> accountable. I couldn't agree more. Um, 
we do GINA, and I, I think the, a lot of the policies are, are uh, reactive uh, instead of being pro proactive. And I think the, the dichotomy here is that there is an, an, an impression that public protecting the public and innovation are mutually exclusive. So it's going to have to be one or the other. And uh, they're, they're not. And in fact, if we don't, um, if we're not proactive in putting those regulations and involving everyone at the table, we, we have seen that there can be backlash and also a breach of trust in this technology and of public trust. Uh, one example is the use of facial recognition. Um, I mean, uh, Amazon just announced yesterday that it, they were suspending for one year the police use of, of their technology for facial recognition. And uh, IBM also announced that a few days ago. So having to wait for the technology to develop and then see what went wrong and try to fix it quickly, I think that uh, is very harmful and uh, can also hurt the technology itself. Go ahead, Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, you all kind of already commented on the next question that I was going to ask, but this is more from a computer science perspective where uh, we're asked, what is your advice for uh, machine learning researchers who would like to better align their work with the policy and legal concerns, uh, particularly in research areas of public interest, such as privacy, privacy and expandability? And Dr. Torasi, what you mentioned about sort of having everybody already at the table is that's what I was like, it's sort of a follow up, but I was wondering if there's any additional comments uh, specifically for the computer scientists in the audience. So the additional comment I would like to make um, is about the um, developing a very strong statistical framework um, because computer science and statistics don't always go hand in hand. We, we assume that they're um, similar or sometimes they do overlap, but they have a very different uh, way of thinking and approaching the problem. Um, so that I advocate for the statistical, for the rigorous statistical framework from the beginning um, in terms of understanding the data and uh, Understanding the data is a first step because that's what goes into the model and we all know garbage in, garbage out. And then the statistical framework, so this is for the development, but then at the same time the statistical framework during the deployment of the technology so that we can monitor the performance across different subgroups, whatever is relevant for the application at hand. Um, so these are the two aspects that I would like to highlight uh, from the computer science perspective. It should also be part of our digital ed education when it comes to AI technologies, the ethics of AI, uh, that should, part, should be part of um, uh, our learning, of our education, both for the developers and I do advocate that for the users as well, as I, I mentioned that um, in my presentation. We are consumers of the technology. Forget computer scientists, um, the society. There is a, a, a responsibility as, a city, as citizens to be informed consumers of the technology. So we need to spread that responsibility across the developers, the regulators, but also the users. Sure, thank you so much. And what are the efforts uh, should be underway to ensure that policymakers are objectively educated about the potential benefits and pitfalls of AI and data-driven policy? This is to all the panelists. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a a similar um, question um, to to the previous one. I think just at a larger scale, and I think. What's really, really important when it comes to tech governance or responsible use of technology is to understand that you can see technology through so many lenses at the same time because it touches so many lives and aspects of our lives at the same time. So it's really important, um, as we just heard, that um, computer scientists um, work with the legal community, but it's also very important that the legal community works with the computer scientist community. Um, and it's actually also very important that we have FSS on board. And it's also quite important that we think about the economic impacts of the technology that we're deploying and we think about the human rights implications of that. And it's important that we think about the political dimension of that because it's technology that is being used in so many different ways. 
So actually having that dialogue is extremely important and enriching. It's very, um, it's challenging because I think only through dialogue, you really start to understand that you technically speak in the same language, but you really don't. And only with going back and forth, you try to understand what the concepts are that you actually care about. So I think really sitting down with as many people as possible that are completely different than you is actually what broadens your, your mind and gives you good inspiration for good governance. And I think for, from a global perspective, the idea of inclus inclusivity is even more pressing and, and, and more important because uh, a lo lot of countries, low to middle income countries are playing catch up and they might think that a certain technology is just transposable uh, to, to their um, setting, but that's not necessarily the case because it's a different context, a different environment, and also a need of different data sets. You know, using health data from Europe might not be applicable to sub-Saharan Africa. So the policies have to also keep that in mind and the policymakers have to be trained in that respect. And uh, also the access of, to um, the implementation of data protection laws and privacy laws, um, the countries at a different level of, of, uh, of I would say, awareness of, of um, uh, regulation Relations. So we have to make sure that there is some consistency and that all the players are at the table and not just have the countries that are more advanced uh, having a seat at the table deciding what others will follow. Otherwise, that, that will just perpetuate the inequalities even further. Um, yeah, that was actually one of the things that um, we were wondering about in um, some of the points that you mentioned as cons of using uh, AI in countries that don't have the uh, the policy plan in place uh, for such a like adaptation or transition. Um, so I wanted, I was wondering, um, well, let's actually, let me go back to the questions from the audience and um, so we could get through all of them. The next question I wanted to ask is how could uh, right to reasonable inf uh, inference did we ask this one already? No. How could the right to reasonable inference deal with managing different treatments or discriminatory outcomes on the basis of sensitive in, uh, inferences? Yeah, um, it's a very great question. Thank you for that. Um, it's, it's my ongoing research project, which will be running for the next couple of years that I'm currently working on. And what I'm trying to do and how I try to approach it is actually to break it down to the specific sectors um, and the specific application and try to figure out what would a right to reasonable inferences look like in that specific particular instance. I've looked at it from just, you know, data protection law and discrimination law, and I could feel that actually doesn't give you a great deal of guidance of how to, you know, in, use inference analytics in a normative acceptable way. So I think it's more helpful to take that non-discrimination law and non protection law and also look at the sectorial laws that apply to it. And I'm currently working on a couple of research projects. One has to do with online advertisement and targeting. One has to do with um, financial uh, services and financial sector. Um, I have one that is focusing on health. I have one that is focusing on criminal justice and one that is focusing on employment. So because their opportunities are so different there, I digging into all of those sectors and try to figure out what are the potential risks and what are the potential benefits that would arise if we use information analytics there. What can we do to really harness the great potential that lies there while at the same time safeguarding that? And yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, talk to, about this a bit more offline and share some work that I have done on, on, on that, that topic, if that's of interest. Thank you so, so much. Um, I could go on, we could take, you know, keep going forever, <laughs> but I think we are out of time and I just wanted to thank you all so much and huge, huge applause. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you to our audience. Um, I'm going to, um, you know, ask Bree to join us and who's going to be introducing the uh, uh, keynote address. Thank you again. For, thank, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.